The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Tonight, the race for Illinois governor takes more turns and twists. Now, State Treasurer Dan Rutherford is on the defensive. But is the lawsuit against him politically motivated? And how much will it matter in the upcoming primary? A ray of hope for new moms in need will take you inside the program helping young homeless mothers regain their footing, one baby step at a time. Plus, it's a growing problem in Illinois, credit card fraud and identity theft. With so many people using plastic, how safe are consumers and businesses? These stories and much more on In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Chris Beery. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Tonight, a closer look at the growing problem of identity theft. The crime has stolen the headlines in recent weeks with Target, Michaels, and Neiman Marcus and other retailers reporting massive data breaches. Here in Illinois, the Attorney General says complaints climbed 18% last year to 3,000 from 2,500 the year before. Last year, Americans lost $21 billion to identity theft. If you think you're immune, think again. Experts say we are all vulnerable. It's just a matter of time. Tonight, what local politicians are doing about it and the ordeal of one woman whose stolen wallet led to a financial disaster. I went into my purse um, to get my wallet to buy another drink, but my purse was there and I had a digital camera and that was in there, so everything was in my purse except my wallet. A night out with friends more than 10 years ago turned into a nightmare for Megan Ross of Chicago. When she realized her wallet was gone, she immediately canceled her credit cards, filed a police report, and made follow-up calls. She figured that was the end of it. About a year and a half later, she discovered the problem was much bigger. This private investigator showed up at my parents' house and tried to serve my dad papers, saying that one of my buildings were foreclosing. Police say a 37-year-old convicted check forger had assumed Ross's identity and used it to buy three properties on the west side of Chicago. Total bill, more than $400,000. Ross's credit was destroyed. My family had to hire lawyers because I had to keep going to court. Like, the banks were coming after me for all of these mortgage payments. Um, the city of Chicago was coming after me because overgrown lawn bills. Megan lost her credit card the old-fashioned way. But now, millions of consumers are falling victim to data breaches when computer hackers gain access to sensitive information. And over the last year alone, the number of complaints my office has received on data breaches has jumped more than 1,000 percent. Illinois Attorney General Lisa Madigan testified during a recent hearing on cyber criminals. It came in the wake of the huge data breach at retailer Target during the holiday shopping season. Computer hackers got their hands on the personal information of millions of Target customers. The arts and crafts store Michaels suffered a similar breach. And last July, thieves broke into an advocate health care office in Park Ridge stealing computers containing the health records of four million people. In all, millions of credit card numbers, names, phone numbers, and addresses were now on the black market. We have this shadowy network of people on the internet that while you're sleeping, they're on the other side of the globe finding ways of getting your data to separate you from your money. Bill Cressy is a professor at St. Xavier University in Chicago who heads up the Center for the Study of Fraud and Corruption. He says cybercrime is a growing problem that requires an international response. Madigan says companies need to do a better job of protecting consumer data. So the notion that companies are already doing everything they can to prevent breaches is false. We've seen, you know, situations where literally the information is obtained because documentation with sensitive information is being thrown into a dumpster and people have, you know, gotten it out and, and used that uh, for illicit purposes. Pressy's team found that while data breaches are on the rise, in the majority of identity theft cases, the victims knew who stole their financial identities. Your cousin who may have a lot of gambling debts or is otherwise dishonest, he knows your mother's maiden name. 
he may know your social security number. And joining us is Leo Cole, general manager of security solutions for TrustWave. And Leo, welcome. Thank so, you, Chris. So, Megan looked like she had done all the right things. How does a consumer like Megan protect herself? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I th Chris, I think we all um, have been pretty well educated on, you know, making sure we don't click on links and email and, um, you know, making sure that when we open a document, we're expecting a document and things like that. Uh, but when you swipe your credit card, um, you're entering into a trust relationship with that merchant or that retailer. And, you know, there really is a trust relationship that has to be established there. Um, and retailers uh, and banks need to, uh, to make sure that those trust relationships are intact. Well, who's responsible between the merchant and the bank? Because lately, we've seen in these hearings, they're kind of pointing fingers at each other. Well, well first, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult problem. Um, the uh, um, cybercrime is, is extremely well funded. Um, it's extremely well organized. And, uh, you know, the, the transaction, the, 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 way, the way a transaction is um, transacted, it, it, it traverses a lot of different places. And so banks and um, merchants, retailers, well, I mean, we all need to make sure that uh, we've got the right, the right uh, security in place and, and, and beef up the security where, where we need to. Well, the banks are saying that the retailers have to do a, a better job of protecting their security networks. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, the, the studies that we've seen and that we've conducted, um, retailers and hospitality um, are, are the number one targets now. Um, interestingly, it kind of shifted away from financial institutions. Um, and if you think about that, financial institutions spend a lot of money on security and uh, their security has, has gotten pretty good. Um, and now, you know, it's time that, that retailers and um, hospitality and others kind of follow suit on that. And now the, the retailers are turning the tables on the banks and saying, look, we need to have a, a better card. We need, we need a card with a, a computer chip in that, which you see in most of uh, Europe and, and the rest of the world, but not in the United States. Would, mm -hmm. would that be a significant improvement, having that computer chip in one of those cards. Yeah, yeah, that's an improvement, but um, but it doesn't. I don't, in my opinion, would not solve the whole problem. It's 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 such a complex problem. I mean, it, it, if you think about the problem, it's it's how are the attackers going to get at the data? How do they get in the environment? Um, what do they do once they're in the environment? And then how do they get the data out of the environment? I mean, think about your house. Your house has a number of entry points. You've got the front door. You've got the back door. The side doors. You've got the windows, maybe you've got second floor windows, maybe you've got a garage. You know, do you have uh, locks and alarms and is that all that monitored on a 24 by seven basis uh, at your house? And you know, do you have someone watching that? Do you have a guard dog? Um, you know, how, to what extent do you have everything protected? And, and, and that's kind of what a business needs to look at is all those entry points, do they have them all protected? Once the data is inside, is the data encrypted on the databases? Is it all protected? And is there, you know, monitoring place uh, to make sure that if something is abnormal, um, that they recognize that and do something about it? Are you saying here that the crooks are just smarter and more sophisticated than most retailers and banks? Well, that's an issue. I don't know if they're smarter or not, but um, they are attacking this problem in a very smart way. So what we've seen, you know, you know is a, a, another survey uh, that we did. Um, 80% of uh, IT specialists were forced to, um, you know, t to build out new applications, um, even though there were, there might be security risks. And so, there's been a, a um, you know, it's a natural business. Um, you know, naturally, you want to get your applications up because that's a revenue producer. You want to have new technology because that's efficiency. Um, but I think what we what we really need to do now is make sure that at the same time we're putting the right security in place. So, you know, another stat around that is um, so 80 percent of the people that uh, were in our survey um, said that they they needed to double their security staff in order to make all that happen. Well, there aren't enough people for that right now. Well, they've got to do something. I mean, if you look at the size of the target breach. It's mind-boggling. It, Forty million accounts yeah, were yeah. compromised. Tens I mean, of millions. The, the, the scale of that mm -hmm. is incredible. Tens of millions. So what we've seen now in, in the market um, is, uh, you know, retailers, hospitality, others asking for help. 
Uh, they don't have they don't have the skills. They don't have the staff. Um, so they're going to uh, providers, you know, such as Trust Wave, and saying, "What do we need to do?" And then, how can you help us do it? How can you augment our staff? Because we just can't we can't find the right skills. Um, so they're coming, you know, to to get help. And so it's a recognized problem. It's a board level problem. Uh, Security has always been a board level problem, but now it's not just a check the box problem. It's a okay, come spend a couple hours and explain to us how we're not the next ones that are going to get breached. For us consumers, perhaps it's it's back to the future. Are we better off just using cash? <laughs> sure, we can turn the internet off. We can get rid of email. Um, you know, we can put our cash in our mattresses. Um, I don't think any of us really want to do that. Um, I enjoy using the internet. I enjoy. Um, you know, I put my credit card information in just like everyone else, even though I know the risks that are involved. Um, no, I don't think that's the answer. I think, you know, making sure that we're all aware, aware of the problems um, and then making sure that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is a trust relationship. And if you lose trust with one of your merchants, you're not going to use them anymore. Leo, on that note, we have to uh, wrap it up. But we have a, a question from one of our viewers who reached out to us on Facebook that I want to post to you. Troy Webster asked, what makes this latest round of breaches more prevalent than others? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I think it's just the, the sheer volume of the people that are affected. And you just said it, you know, you know tens of millions of people were affected. Um, and then also, it's, it's all over the news. Um, we all know about it. And it really is personalized, and it's affecting all of us. Um, and, you know, very few of us have... Uh, survived any of these breaches and not had, you know, one of our credit card numbers uh, in, in one of these breaches. So it's, it's just in our face constantly. Leo, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate it. Very, well, thank very you, much. Chris. Now here's a look at some other stories that are affecting us here locally. Bombshell allegations against Republican gubernatorial candidate Dan Rutherford. A former staffer filed federal suit accusing the state treasurer of sexual harassment. To make false allegations against the state treasurer as he has, I say that this is absolutely, totally political. The accuser, Edmund Michalowski, also claims Rutherford demanded he take part in political activities while working for the state. It sounds like he's kind of just looking for 15 minutes of fame instead of really giving allegations that are true. I think allegations with political figures go hand in hand and it's mudslinging time because we're coming down to the wire. Contractors, police yourselves. Chicago aldermen are one step closer to requiring people who do business with the city to report any corrupt activity they've witnessed or risk losing lucrative contracts with the city. Many question how effective this new measure will be. I think that's weird that they would think the contractors would report it. And, you know, the corruption in Chicago is so deep and so embedded and has been going on for so long, I don't really see a way out of it. Does Chicago need a more bike and pedestrian friendly landscape? One civic group wants to create 20 car free zones in public plazas around the city, including some well known locations. No more horse drawn carriages in Chicago? That could be the case if one alderman gets his way, citing safety, sanitation, and possible animal cruelty concerns. Alderman Ed Burke and the mayor seem to want this Chicago tradition to ride into the sunset. I think obviously we'll have a debate and a discussion, but I have my general support. The horse carriages are, that's part of Chicago, Michigan Avenue. I think that the uh, carriages is actually, a lot of people, it's a nice attraction for Chicago. Today we're joined by Jada Russell, founder and chief strategist for High Style Marketing and PR, Ty Wansley, radio personality for Clear Channel Chicago, and David Vigiano, media director for Alpatec Marketing. Hello and welcome to you all. Hello. Thank you for having us. Some explosive allegations this week and a federal lawsuit against Republican gubernatorial candidate Dan Rutherford, who's also the state treasurer, a former staffer, uh, basically accusing him of both verbally and physically sexually harassing him and forcing him to do campaign work on a taxpayer's expense. Now, the treasurer has categorically denied all of this, but Jada, you're in the PR business. How damaging is this to him and his campaign? You know, this is, this is um, a serious situation, and um, the timing couldn't be worse. So I think that um, he kind of went into damage control and started to address the situation right away, uh, as far as we know in terms of um, getting in front of the lawsuit. But um, I think it could hurt him. I think it could hurt him, but, you know, we have to kind of wait and see how things shake out, how much more information comes about. Um, it's still very murky right now, I think. There's both sides are very firm and what they, you know, believe is true. So we have to sort of wait and see. Yeah, I mean, Ty, these, these allegations are two and three years old. 
They're released five weeks before a major primary. Jada mentioned the timing. How do you think voters will respond to this? Well, I've been in this town for a minute. And <laughs> a little I, more than I, that. I've, I've, worked, I've worked in several other major markets, and I, I find, as Jada was saying, the timing ironic because just this week I had former colleagues ranging all the way from D.C. to Houston calling me saying, once they saw this story, what in the heck is going on with Chicago politics now? Uh, it's like, can, can the plot get any thicker? And uh, there was nothing I could tell them. I said, I'm waiting to see just like you. So it, Chicago politics seemed to get even more bizarre by the minute. David, you look like you have something to say about this. I always have something to say. <laughs> I think one of the issues here, obviously, when there are these type of allegations, is that there's very rarely any witnesses. So we don't know. It comes down to the old case of he said, he said. But, you know, so how can you prove it? The timing, of course, we talked about that, is, is very odd. But uh, Rutherford is claiming that Rauner, one of his opponents um, in the Republican primary, is behind this. And if that's the case, I find it kind of sad. Uh, Rauner has more money than any of his opponents. Uh, he's outspending them. He's beating them by double digits. If he needs to do that, then it's um, solely for power. And now, to be clear, Bruce Rauner has categorically denied having anything yes. to do with this. And uh, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, Jada, we'll, we'll go back to you in the PR world. Do you think any of the other Republican candidates are either helped or hurt by this? You know, I, I think time will tell. It's really hard to say. It's so fresh. It's so new. There's so many things that are so unclear about this. You know, everyone is very firm that they have reasons for why this happened. Um, Mikulowski is saying that he held the story, held the information because he was waiting to transition into a new job. He has really sound reasons for why he's doing this. But then, at the same time, he is said that, you know, he asked for $300,000 to keep this quiet. So you kind of have to wait for all the facts to kind of come out, and I think that we'll see how it falls. Now, clearly, Governor Quinn benefits from all of this attention. I mean, um, but at a debate this week, between the Republican uh, people battling it out, uh, one of uh, Mr. Rutherford's opponents, Kirk Dillard, asked the treasurer if there were any other potential accusers out there. Now, the crowd booed. Mr. Rutherford did not answer the question. He called it inappropriate. Ty, was it an inappropriate question? No, I think it was very strategic, especially in this market. I mean, there's, there's no politics like Illinois politics. <laughs> so I'm not going to say it was a good question or a bad question. I'll say it was just very strategic. And I also find it interesting that we just had Governor Christie in town. And all of the Republican gubernatorial c contenders except one were basically fleeing from him. So we have this big magnet, no pun intended, <laughs> we, we, we have a, a national magnet coming into town who could garner a lot of uh, attention and maybe some funding, but everybody's running away from him. So, um, again, there's, there's no politics like Illinois politics. There certainly is. And after seeing two former governors end up in prison, uh, hearing allegations about a potential contender that involve ethics violations, possibly forcing people on their staff to do campaign work on taxpayer time. David, do you think voters have any patience for this anymore, or have we just gotten used to this? No, and that's exactly what I was going to say. I think we're pretty savvy now. We know what's going on. We understand Illinois politics and the dirty play. And I think people are just like, unless there's something specific and proof to come out, I don't think it'll affect any voters' opinions about any of the candidates. All right, we'll move on here. Speaking of ethics, Chicago City Council advanced a measure that requires city council, city contractors, people who do business with the city, to self-report corruption. <laughs> Ty, Sorry. is this a credible solution or just business as usual? Forgive me, but my initial reaction was I chuckled. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to do a belly laugh, but I'm thinking, are you serious? In Chicago, how can you expect, and I know it's improper to assume, but how can you expect our would-be politicians or our incumbents to police themselves, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, these are contractors who have mm -hmm. lucrative contracts with the city, such as the red light cameras, which we've seen. But they have the lucrative contracts because of their ties to the politicians. Right. So I'm saying, in, in that regard, I can't expect any self-policing. 
Yeah, I mean, None what if the odds someone will turn themselves in and risk losing their contract, David? Absolutely, and not just risk losing their contract, but risk losing their reputation, uh, possible litigation. There's all kinds of other ramifications. Uh, there's uh, other situations where contractors have discovered some impropriety within, and they took care of it, the, took care of it themselves. They fired the employee, paid back the money, and brushed it under the table. Now, I'm not saying you should hide things, but I'm saying that maybe there's a better way and that's a more effective way. Now I think they're going to just be more terrified of anything coming out because there's more ramifications, and I just don't think it's a good thing. Everybody I spoke with about in this had the same initial reaction as Ty. They just laughed. It just seems completely silly. Now the mayor has called this a key reform. Jada, is he right? Oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but um, what it does provide is some balance. Right now, the aldermen are legally bound to report, and the contractors are not. So at least now you have both parties that are legally bound to this process. Where that goes from there, I'm not sure. But at least now it's balanced. All right. Another proposal that could make its way before the city council comes from a civic group called the Active Transportation Alliance. Now, they've proposed 20 car-free zones in the city, uh, building of pedestrian malls to make it easier to walk and shop. Now, part of this involves closing down parts of Michigan Avenue, Dearborn, Monroe, Clark Street in the, Roop, in the Loop, Oak and Rush Streets. David, is this a good idea? Well, I think it can be a good idea. A lot of people hearken back to the State Street debacle, and it was a complete disaster trying to close off part of that. But I think some of these things could be good. I think you have to be very strategic about where it's happening. I think Michigan Avenue would be ridiculous. It's a, it's a hard enough uh, place to maneuver with a car and traffic as it is, and to close uh, Michigan Avenue from Oak Street all the way to the, the river. I think would be a disaster. I love the idea, though, of Monroe from Michigan Avenue to the lake um, because so many pedestrians and bike riders want to go. They, they rent their bike and want to go to the lakefront, and it's really dangerous. So if you close that off and create an underpass under Lakeshore Drive to get to the lakefront, I think that would be wonderful. I live up north, though, and there's a section that they're proposing from on Bryn Mawr, from Broadway, to uh, Lakeshore Drive, which would be a nightmare. That's one of the major ways to get on the Lakeshore Drive up north. There's not many other, it's, it's bad enough traffic as it is. So I think really, I think we should be asking a lot of the people who live in these neighborhoods too, what they think and what their opinions are. I mean, would this not mean gridlock in some places and a traffic nightmare on the way to and from the city in some spots? Didn't work for Jane Byrne. I can't see it working now. <laughs> yeah. Now some people, to be fair, some people say it was the execution of that particular State mm -hmm. Street project mm -hmm. and, and the details, not necessarily the idea of it. Should we be intrepid and give it another shot? When I first moved to Chicago in 1980, my first home was in Oak Park. And I loved the Mayberry RFD feel of Oak Park. <laughs> it was like the quintessential all-American town, and to many people it still is. But they closed off the mall there, and I think it's been effective over the years. So I agree with you to a degree. It's, it's how you do it, because in Oak Park, I think it's been effectively done. Mm -hmm. All right. One, another proposal we'll take a look at is, speaking of snarled traffic, 14th Ward Alderman Ed Burke is proposing the city not renew the licenses for the city's 25 horse-drawn carriages, essentially banning them from the city. Uh, New York City is also considering a similar proposal. Jada, is this a good idea? You know, I've, I've been listening to the people on this one. I'm a driver, so getting behind a, a horse really just drives me crazy sometimes. <laughs> but I'm listening to the people, and, and, you know, it's a part of the city's charm. It's a part of Chicago. It's a part of downtown Chicago. People come here to see that when, they, when we're downtown. We love to see it in the winter, Valentine's Day, big holidays. It's part of the nostalgia of being a Chicagoan. But um, I don't know. It, it, has some, it has some merit. It really does cause traffic problems. And some people see it as an animal cruelty issue, mm -hmm. having horses share the streets with cabs and cars and pedestrians. Uh, I'm not exactly sure that I would call it animal cruelty. I would say what Michael Dick did to dogs is animal cruelty. I think that these, uh, the, these horses are the bread and butter for these uh, carriage riders, and they take very good care of them. They need to. That, that's, that's where they make their money. Um, so I would say that maybe... They're closed down. If we do close down some streets, we can put the horse carriages there on those streets, and then there'll be no traffic issues. Very retro. See, Ty, we'll let you have the last word on this. Uh, I was going to say a, a very good friend of mine owns a company that's right next to one of those horse stables. And so I visited his business morning, noon, and night over the years. And those horse, horses, when they come in, they are exhausted. So I, I feel for them. I really do. All right. We'll leave it at that. 
Jada Russell, Ty Wansley, David Vigiano, thank you for your time. Teen pregnancies are on the decline in Illinois, but the problems that plague one group of adolescent moms seems never ending. A Chicago organization hopes to ease the burden, offering help and hope to young mothers who are also homeless. Abigail Quezada was 16 years old, a senior in high school, when she found out she was pregnant. I was really terrified. First thing I was terrified is just tell my parents. My dad was very disappointed. I was like his angel, the good one. He wanted to cry. He just like kicked me out. He like, no, I don't want you pregnant. With nowhere else to go, Abigail learned about New Moms, a nonprofit group that takes in pregnant homeless girls, some as young as 13 years old. The program's goal, preparing young mothers for the lifelong challenges of parenthood. What we do is let these young women know that anything is possible and that they can accomplish it. Education is key to that. I didn't know anything, literally. I didn't know how to change a diaper. I didn't know what to do when my baby cried. Everything was so new, and I was so young. I, I'm like, oh, I'm not ready to be a mom, but I had to. I had to learn everything. For the past 30 years, New Moms has provided young homeless moms with housing, job training, and everything a newborn needs, from diapers to baby food. They provided me help, like with pampers, with formula. I, I really learned that you're not supposed to baby talk a baby, and now she's very well spoken. New Moms participants also get help building a career in the Academy of Professional Development program. The 13 week class teaches basic job skills and much more. What about your appearance? What is your appearance saying right now when people see you on TV? And at the end of that time, if they haven't already secured employment, we continue to work with them. If it takes them two years to find a job, as long as they stay engaged, we will work with them. Now in her early 20s, Abigail works part-time at Home Depot. She's earned her high school diploma and plans to study nursing. Abigail is reconciled with her father and credits her success as an employee, a student, and a mother to her daughter, to the training she received from new moms. I learned so much because when I was 16 or 15 prior, I was really rebellious with my parents. During my pregnancy and participating in New Moms, I learned that I needed to stop, I needed to change. Abigail's hopes for her own little girl? Really, really hoping that she, she takes really good steps. I know a lot of kids don't, but hopefully she learns from me that if I could do it, she could definitely do it, go way and beyond than, than I could. To learn more about new moms, log on to our website, wycc.org, and look for In the Loop. Well, that wraps up another episode of In the Loop. The discussion continues right now online at wycc.org slash in the loop. Join us to hear our guests weigh in on the price hikes at Taste of Chicago and the state's new ad campaign to sell health insurance to young people. Until next time, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Good night.